Uh, thank you very much. Um, first of all, thanks to the organizers for inviting me to this really wonderful workshop. There's been really spectacular progress on a lot of the topics we've heard about uh, over the last few years, and it's been really stimulating, interesting set of talks. Um, so thank you very much. Um, what I'm going to talk about here is perhaps a little bit off topic. So I will be talking about uh, holography. Um, I won't be doing any localization, at least in the physics sense, uh, although some of the formulas that you'll see later can be localized in the mathematics sense, just using the fixed point theorem of Berlin and Verne. Uh, anyway, this is work in progress, so there's no paper yet. We're still very much working on this topic uh, with Chris Cousins, Jerome Gauntlet, and Dario Martelli. Uh, probably many of you here know Jerome and Dario. Uh, Chris is uh, Dario's uh, PhD student, and he was at the school here last week. All right, so what, what are we going to be interested in? Can you read this at the back, by the way? Is that, is that all right? So we're interested in type 2B, supersymmetric, ADS3 times Y7 solutions. And here, Y7 is going to be a compact 7 manifold. And these will be holographically dual to two dimensional 0, 0,2 superconformal field theories. So the amount of supersymmetry is such that we get 0, 0,2 sim, uh, supersymmetry for the dual field theory that lives on the conformal boundary um, of this ADS3. Uh, so I'll make a few general remarks before uh, getting into the details of this. On the field theory side, so typically we don't have a nice Lagrangian description of these superconformal field theories here. Usually at best what we have is some UV Lagrangian for a supersymmetric quantum field theory that we believe flows to an interesting interacting superconformal fixed point. Under those assumptions, there are then certain protected quantities, BPS quantities, that you can compute at the fixed point using that UV description. Uh, so examples of quantities in this setting would be the central charge of the 2D CFT and also the U1R symmetry. So for 2D 0, 0,2 theories, there's a U1R symmetry uh, uh, which sits in the same multiplet of the stress energy tensor. It plays an important role in the theory. For example, it determines the scaling dimensions of chiral primary operators. And you can compute these in the UV theory using C extremization, which I'll uh, explain a little bit later. The point I wanted to make is that whenever you can do these kind of uh, exact calculations of protected quantities in the field theory, I think there should also be an analogous calculation you can do on the gravity side. A priori, that's not obvious. Usually in supergravity, as we heard someone mentioned yesterday, you have to solve the Einstein equations to get anywhere. Uh, they're nonlinear coupled PDEs. It's very difficult to do that, even when you've got a lot of symmetry. However, I think you should be able to compute protected quantities on the gravity side without knowing the full solution to the equations of motion. And what I'll show you today is, is, is how you can set that up. Uh, there are other examples, too, uh, that I've worked out in the past. Of course, you've still got some PDE to solve on the gravity side. You can't get around that, but you need some existence theorem in that case. And the analogy to have in mind is Yao's theorem for Calabi-Yau metrics. So we don't know any explicit solutions on compact Calabi-Yau manifolds, uh, but we can still work with them and compute lots of things with them. But that really does rely on Yao's theorem that tells you that they exist in the first place. All right, so that's the, that's the philosophy. No, so, well, for the sorts of theories that I'll be discussing, they're D3 brain backgrounds, so you'll see in a moment. So, and there'll be D3 brains wrapped on Riemann surfaces, for example, are the sorts of theories that I'm going to be talking about. Okay, so, uh, good. Uh, Maybe that's a bit low. So what are, what are the class of backgrounds? So uh, on the gravity side, I've got a 10-dimensional metric. And 
And that takes the form L squared e to the minus b over 2. So L is just some length scale. Ah. Then in brackets, I've got the metric on ADS3 plus some metric ds squared 7 on my 7-manifold y7. And this b here is a warp factor. It's a function on y7. So if you want, that's my ansatz or class of metrics that I want to look at. And the, other, the only other field that's turned on in type 2b is going to be the 5 form. So again, there's some dimensional factor L to the 4. And then I've got the volume form on ADS3. And I can only wedge that with a 2 form, which must then be a 2 form on Y7. And I need to make that self-dual. So it's minus the Hodge dual on, with respect to the seven manifold of F. Um, the five form needs to be closed in type 2B. And so in particular, F is also closed. And so locally, I can write it as DA. So this is a class of uh, type 2B backgrounds we want to consider. They were first considered by uh, Kim in about 2005. Um, so you see I've got a metric on Y7. I've got a scalar field, B, on Y7. And I've got essentially a gauge field, F, or A with curvature F on Y7. Also, because I've only got five form flux turned on, in some sense, these are D3 brain backgrounds, is how we should think of them physically. Uh, if you plug that into the 10D equations of motion, you'll get some equations of motion for this metric, uh, scalar, and uh, two form. Sorry? No, but you could do. It's just my choice not to. Yeah, I, I know. And I think you, can do, you could do something similar to what I'm going to do for those cases. Uh, this works out particularly nicely. Uh, but you're absolutely right. You could, you, could, you could do what I'm doing here in other cases, too. All right, so there are equations of motion for these things, and they come from an action. And you can write it down. So I'll write the action as S, and it's a functional of this seven-dimensional metric, B, which, remember, is a function. It's not the B field. It's a function. And A, which is a gauge field on U1 gauge field on Y7. And it, it looks like this. So the precise form is not so important, but well, it, it is for if you want to calculate with it. But uh, anyway, e to the minus 2b, you've got a volume form. There's a Ricci scalar on Y7. Minus 6, that's a cosmological constant term. Then there's a kinetic term for B. And there's a Yang-Mills term for uh, A with curvature F. All right, so I, don't, I, hope, you can, I hope you can see that. Anyway, that's, that's the action from which the equations of motion for this follow in 10 dimensions. Um, however, we, we don't just want bosonic solutions, we want supersymmetric solutions. There are some killing spinner equations in that case, but you can reformulate the killing spinner equations in terms of geometric conditions on Y7. So if you do that, when the dust settles, you get the following structure. So firstly, there exists a unit norm, killing vector, Psi. So that's on Y7, and it arises as a bilinear. And I'll write that in terms of some coordinate Psi as 2 times d by d Psi. And the metric then looks like the following. So ds squared 7 is a half 
e psi plus p squared plus e to the b ds squared. And this metric here is Kähler. So it's a 6D transverse Kähler metric. And it's transverse to this vector field. So you've got some vector field on your 7-manifold. And transverse to that, there's some 6D metric. And that metric has to be Kähler. Supersymmetry tells you that. Everything is now determined by uh, what I've just told you. So e to the b, this scalar, is just one-eighth times the Ricci scalar of the Kähler metric, the 6D Ricci scalar. Um, there's this connection term, capital P, here, appearing in the metric. So dp is rho, which is the Ricci form of the Kähler metric. And finally, f, this uh, abelian gauge field flux on y7, is minus twice the Kähler form. So j is the Kähler form. And then there's an exact piece, plus a half d. Uh, e to the minus b, e psi plus p. So hopefully you can see, once you fix this choice of vector field and the choice of Kähler metric, uh, everything else down here is now determined in terms of that data, the other field. And I want to label that set of conditions as star, because I'm going to use it later. And it's equivalent to supersymmetry. So imposing supersymmetry is equivalent to these geometric conditions on Y7 and these other fields. Finally, there's one more equation to impose, and that's the Bianchi identity for F5, which is equivalent to the equation of motion for F, right? And that gives you this funny-looking equation. So box R is a half r squared minus Ricci tensor contracted into itself. And everything here is for the Kähler metric. So that's boxes for this Kähler metric. Everything is Kähler metric. And I'll call that dagger. And that's equivalent to uh, the Bianchi identity for F5. It's a fact that supersymmetry plus the Bianchi identity implies the equations of motion in this case. So these solutions are necessarily critical points of this action. And you should compare this, so CF, so some of you at least have worked on Suzuki einstein geometry. If you, if you haven't, then just ignore the comment. But this looks very similar to Suzuki einstein geometry, which arises in a very similar way for ADS5, times Y5 solution. There's a very similar structure. So this is, again, a unit killing vector field. There's a transverse Kähler metric and so on. OK. What do I want to do next? So here's, here's a key remark. If we restrict this action functional, S, over there, to a subspace of the field configuration space. So you start off with a space which is metric, this scalar B, and this U1 gauge field A. And solutions to the equations of motion are critical points of this action on this space. But I can restrict to a subspace. And if I do that, solutions are also critical points. Of the action restricted to the subspace. It's, it's kind of a trivial statement, but it's important. So 
uh, all I'm saying here is that, uh, so here you're setting the derivatives of your action functional to zero in every direction for a critical point. Uh, here I'm just requiring derivatives to be zero along some subspace, but that's a necessary condition to have a solution. Uh, that's all that I'm saying. And then the trick is to pick a smart subspace in this case. But there's a completely natural one, uh, namely the solutions to the supersymmetry equations, which is star. So there's now a computation to do, so you compute. So in a horrible abuse of notation, I'm going to take my original functional, S, my action functional, restrict it to star, those are the solutions to the supersymmetry equations, and I'm going to keep calling that S. And if you do that, you get the following formula. So, it's, of course, it's an integral over y7, but it's extremely simple. Uh, so, that's it. Where eta I have defined as this one form that's dual to xi. So, that's just the one form dual to the killing vector. And so, in particular, d eta is a half times the Ricci form rho. So you get this very simple formula for the action functional. Eta wedge rho, rho is the Ricci form, and J is the Kähler form of this Kähler metric. No, I'm off shell still, right? So all I've imposed at this point is supersymmetry. I have not imposed this equation of motion up here. So I'm off shell. So far, I can pick whatever vector field I like still, and I can pick any Kähler metric. Of course, for solutions, they should, you expect some restriction on this vector field. I should have said this earlier, perhaps. This vector field is dual to the R symmetry, and we expect that to be uniquely fixed for the solution. So you can probably see where this is going now. This is, what, this is the function I need to extremize. There are a few more details, though. Um, so a, a few remarks. So this S, it depends on the Kähler metric only via the Kähler class. And to be precise, it's the transverse Kähler class. Uh, so if you shift J, uh, if you shift, uh, choose a different Kähler metric, um, but keep the same Kähler class, this functional doesn't change. Uh, well, I, I don't know whether to write, this is perhaps too technical. So this thing lives in some basic cohomology of the foliation for the vector field, but anyway. Uh, in the nice case where the orbits of the vector field all close up, so you get a circle action on Y7, uh, this is just the Kähler class of the base Kähler manifold. But I want to move the vector field, and in general, its orbits won't, won't close. Uh, anyway, so that looks like a good start. Um, there's also this equation of motion to impose over here, this uh, rather horrible quadratic thing involving the curvature. So F5 is closed, if and only if dagger holds over there, the right-hand side. And so a necessary condition for solving that equation is that it's integral of the left-hand side is the integral of the right-hand side. So if you integrate dagger over y7, you also get something very simple. Eta wedge rho wedge rho wedge j is zero. So it looks almost like this one. It's just you swap one of the j's for a rho. Uh, that's what you get if you integrate that equation over y7. Uh, you get this. So we also certainly need to impose this condition if we want a solution, and I'll call that double dagger. Uh, so another remark. 
is there's also an eight-dimensional geometry that's naturally uh, hanging around in this problem. So I'll call that capital X. And it's uh, a product of the real line, the positive real line, with y7. And I'll introduce a coordinate little r. is positive on the positive real line. And this eight-dimensional geometry is complex. In fact, in some sense, it's Calabi-Yau. So it's a complex manifold. And it has a holomorphic volume form. It's, in that sense, it's Calabi-Yau. So with a holomorphic volume form. So I can write that as capital omega, so 4 comma 0. So it's got four dz uh, indices and no dz bar indices in complex coordinates. And uh, so there's some expression for that. Um, so I'll write it down. It's not, it's not terribly important, but um, here it is. So there's uh, dr plus i r eta here. And this omega is a global transverse 3 comma 0 form. So on the Kähler manifold, that Kähler manifold will have a canonical bundle. And that canonical bundle will have some section. Um, it won't be globally defined section. However, uh, if you look at the metric that I've just erased, uh, you see that this coordinate psi is a connection on the canonical bundle. So if you take the 3, 0 form on the Kähler manifold and you multiply it by e to the i psi, that's a global 3, 0 form on y7. And that also tells you it must have fixed charge 2. under this vector field. So this is a remnant of the R symmetry that you'd see in field theory. This vector field will be dual to the U on R symmetry, and this is telling you that the spinners have got some particular charge in some normalization, and here this has got charge two. Follows from this uh, fact down here. However, so although it's complex, and it's got a holomorphic volume form, it's not Kähler. That's what makes this slightly more exotic and interesting geometry than the uh, Suzuki-Einstein case that I mentioned over there, where this cone is Kähler. All right, so there's one more thing to do. I have a five-form flux, and I need to impose flux quantization for this background. Uh, and that's essentially the last uh, step, so flux quantization. So for all five cycles, uh, so let me call them sigma A in Y7. So this is a five-dimensional manifold, and there's some number of them. I label them by capital A. Uh, then the period of the five-form flux over these should be integer uh, in, uh, with appropriate factors. Uh, so here are the factors, 1 over 2 pi L string to the 4 G string. And you integrate the 5 form over sigma A. So the left-hand side here should be an integer. Dirac flux quantization in this case. And we know the 5 form flux explicitly for the uh, class of background star, the supersymmetric backgrounds that I'm looking at, and you evaluate it, so you get these annoying factors at the front. But here's the key point. The integral is eta wedge rho wedge j. So exactly the same factors again appearing. So there are sort of three key ingredients here. There's the action, which has got eta rho j j. There's this constraint, 
That's from solving this equation of motion over here, which is very similar. It just swaps a j with a rho. And finally, the flux quantization also depends just on these quantities. Um, so I should say, remember that this came from closure of F, this condition. And in fact, this isn't a topological invariant unless that holds because of that reason. Okay? So if you don't impose this, this form isn't closed. And so it's not really, a, this makes no sense as a cycle. It would depend on the specific submanifold. Um, so to make sense of that as a relation in homology, you, you need this double dagger to hold. Anyway, it's a technical comment, but it's, it's important when you come to calculate things. So uh, here's a summary. So you fix, fix a complex cone. There's this eight-dimensional complex geometry with a holomorphic volume form. Fix one of those. It needs to have a holomorphic uh, u1 to the s action. for some s that's at least one, because it needs, I need to have a holomorphic killing vector field, so this is killing, and this, this equation here tells you it's also holomorphic, preserves the complex structure. Uh, so I need at least a holomorphic u1 action to get going. In general, I'll have some torus action, especially if I want to move the vector field around inside this torus. Then s, the action that I've defined, depends only on the choice of vector fields, and you can think of that as just sitting inside the Lie algebra of this torus. That's, a, that's S real choices. And the transverse Kähler class. So I'll just call it J. And that's finite dimensional. That's the key point. So we started off with an uh, action that was uh, a, a functional on infinite dimensional space. This S is still a functional on infinite dimensional space, but it only depends on a finite number of quantities in that space. Just this Kähler class and the choice of vector field. So uh, you pick that setup. You need your holomorphic volume form to have charge two. Just saying the superpotential's got charge two, it's that statement in field theory. We also need this constraint equation, double dagger, uh, this one, to hold. And that's also necessary to impose flux quantization, which is the last step. i.e. you fix a choice of these flux quantum numbers. Then a solution will extremize the function. Once you've imposed those things, you extremize S, which I'm about to erase. And that will determine whatever else remains right? for a critical point. It's a necessary condition. Okay, so what's this got to do? I've said nothing about C extremization so far. Um, but in some sense, this is precisely the analog of that in geometry. So central charge So recall in supergravity, there's a formula for the central charge dual to ADS3 solutions by Brown and uh, Heno, and it's just 3L over 2 times the three-dimensional Newton constant. Capital L is this uh, length scale that uh, I referred to earlier. It's still hanging around in some formulas, so for example, it's still sitting here. 
Well, that can be computed by dimensional reduction from 10 dimensions. So it's equal to 3L to the 8 over 2 times the 10 dimensional Newton constant, integral over Y7. Uh, then you've got this warped volume. So I pulled this formula from the paper of Benini, Bobev, and Cricino. I think they're all here. Um, anyway, if you do dimensional reduction from 10 dimensions, you get this uh, warped volume formula for the um, central charge. And again, if I restrict this to supersymmetric solutions, uh, supersymm yeah, solutions to the supersymmetry equations, but not imposing the equations of motion, it's precisely proportional to this action. So again, there are some uh, various factors of pi and string lengths and so on to make everything dimensionally correct. It's proportional to S, that's the key point. So they started life very differently. S was the action originally, and when I restricted it to S, I got my functional. This is some warped volume, it's definitely different off shell. But when I restrict to supersymmetric uh, solutions to the supersymmetry equations, it's precisely this uh, functional. So extremizing the action is the same as extremizing the central charge. So perhaps here I can just say a sentence about the extremization, and then I'll conclude just with an example. See how you actually have, you can do this in practice, carry out this program, and actually compute uh, central charges of solutions without knowing what the solution is. So C, extremization. So this is Francesco and Nikolai. So they told us that the superconformal U1R symmetry in 2D 0, 0,2 theories extremizes uh, well, C trial and it's a quadratic Tuft anomaly so I won't, I won't write down what it is it's a, it's a quadratic combination of Tuft anomalies and it's because of that that you can compute them in the UV theory and know that you're computing correctly in the IR theory via Tuft anomaly matching and you extremize that over all possible U1R symmetries so that's just symmetries under which the spinners have the appropriate charge or the superpotential's got charge 2 and you extremize it, though, over possible mixing with other abelian flavor symmetries. So to, to go to the gravity side, this torus action that I've got acting holomorphically they'll be dual to some flavor symmetries. So there'll be an R symmetry under which the spinners are charged, but the other combinations the spinner will be uncharged, those will be dual to precisely to these sorts of flavor symmetries, and C extremization resolves that mixing by extremizing C, and hopefully it's clear that I've set up a problem that will do that on the gravity side. Do you want to ask any questions before I give a quick example? I think I've got, I've got 10 minutes, all right. So let, let me actually, all that was just general formalism. Uh, let me actually compute it. Um, so someone mentioned earlier there are solutions with three-form flux. Actually, there are large classes of solutions just, just uh, within this class uh, that I've been talking about. There's a whole zoo of different examples with different topologies for Y7. Um, of course, I can't possibly uh, go through any kind of general analysis of that here on the board. 
So I'm just going to look at a simple case where I've got a two torus times some five manifold. And you should think of these physically as D3 brains wrapped on a T2. That's, that's uh, what we're doing physically. To give you some 2D uh, CFT. Well, firstly, you can prove that there aren't solutions uh, with H2 of Y50. So you need two cycles or three cycles, otherwise there aren't solutions. So for example, there's no T2 times S5 solution. It's very easy to see that from these extremal functions that there's no critical point in that case. So I'm going to assume that H2 of Y5 is R. In other words, I've got a single three cycle in Y5. And I'll call that little sigma. Okay, so sigma is a three cycle in Y5. I can write the Kähler form. This is the transverse Kähler form on Y7. In general, it will be proportional to the volume form on T2. So A is just some constant times the volume form on T2. So that's the Kähler class along the T2. And then there'll be some Kähler class on this Y5, transverse to this vector field. I call that omega. Okay, that's pretty much the most general thing I can write down. So it's a piece on the T2 and it's got a piece on Y5. Um, I need to impose flux quantization. And there are two five cycles in this case. So I'm going to impose capital N units of flux over Y5. That's at a point on T2. Okay, so if I fix a point on T2, I get a copy of Y5, that's a five cycle, and the, the integral of F5 over that, I call that N. But there's another cycle, because I've got a three cycle on Y5, which I can take the product of that with the T2, and that's a five cycle as well. And that will be the only five cycles if Y5 doesn't have any four cycles, which will be the case in my example. So there's two integers then, n and m. And you can plug those into these formulas that I've given to you and simplify and rearrange a bit and you get the following nice expression for the supergravity central charge. So it's some numerical factors times m times n over the integral of eta wedge rho over sigma. And that's it, so that's the central charge. We're still off shell though, so I've not fixed this vector field yet. Okay, so, uh, and this thing in the denominator is a function just of the vector field. There's also the constraint to impose. So I've quantized the flux already. There's also the constraint. And the constraint in this case reads integral over y5, eta wedge rho wedge rho is zero. Uh, so that's it, that's the problem in this case, very simple now. And both of those are just functions of the vector field. Uh, it's it's um, smoothness, at least at the level I've described the solution so far, is, is automatic. So I'm assuming my Y5 is smooth, et cetera. Uh, the complex structure, well, I'm going to write down a case where I fix complex structure on the cone in a moment. 
and that will all be smooth. Whether or not there exists a solution to the PDE, that's an open problem. But you can give that to Yao or someone like that and say, I have this horrible PDE, but I suspect that there always exist solutions to this. Whenever I'm at a critical point of this function, uh, can you please help to prove that? Uh, I, I think that's the strategy. The remark, these depend only on the vector field. There is an example of an example just to make things completely explicit. So I'm going to, uh, so I've got this five manifold, uh, I've got this eight manifold. Um, uh, and then this x hat, x hat six is going to be the cone over y five. And I'll take that to be the total space of complex line bundle. over, so F2, the second Hertzebrook surface. It's just it's some particular complex surface that's diffeomorphic to product of two two spheres with churn numbers P and Q. And X6, which is this uh, cone over y5 will just be this x hat 6 minus the zero section. That is then topologically a product of r uh, times the five manifold. OK, so that's a, and the original eight dimensional complex manifold I was talking about is just a product of this with t2. Um, these are toric. That means that there's a holomorphic U1 cubed action. Uh, so uh, S that I had earlier is, is three in this case. And so you can write your vector field in a basis for the Lie algebra of this torus, say B1, B2, B3. Uh, these are called the YPQ singularities that some people know what they are. And there's a standard basis to use in this case. Anyway, that's, that's uh, my vector field in this basis. Almost done. So the constraint, double dagger, that's, that's down there. If you impose that, that fixes B3 to something, P minus Q, U1P plus B2Q, P minus Q. So it now starts to get very explicit. Um, and you can evaluate these, so I definitely don't have time to do this. You can evaluate this the simplest way is using localization, actually. So I've got some nice resolve space here. These are, uh, you can promote these to equivariant forms on this space, and they localize to the fixed points of the vector field. Uh, which are on the zero section here. So I localized something. Uh, I covered that. Um, and finally, the important thing is this object here that appears in the central charge. If you compute it, it's a quadratic function of B1 and B2. The details don't matter, but just to show you, it's completely explicit. You can use your favorite toric methods to compute it. Some denominator. The, the formula is not important. Just notice it's quadratic in B1 and B2. And so that's what you need to extremize. You don't even need Mathematica to extremize this particular function. Uh, it's just quadratic. 
So you can do it by hand. And if you extremize it and plug back in you get the central charge for a solution. So if there exists a solution for this particular geometry that I've described to you, that is definitely its central charge. And it, it's, I, of course, I picked an example where I know there is a solution. So there is an explicit supergravity solution in this case um, that solves the horrible PDE. Um, and this, this correctly reproduces the central charge. And I think I'm out of time, so I'll, I'll stop there.